the platform. All personnel abandoned. Bloody hell, it's really on fire, isn't it? On the 6th of July 1988, Piper Alpha oil platform explodes and sinks into the North Sea killing 165 men in what can almost be described as a reasonable sequence of events. In the early 70s, a group of four companies collaborate on an exploration to find oil in the North Sea. In 1972, they get an exploration license, and in 1973, they discover the Piper oil field. The four companies form a joint venture called Occidental Petroleum Company Limited, OPCAL, and start work to construct the Piper Alpha oil platform and the pipelines to carry oil to the Flotter oil terminal on the Orkney Islands, which will receive and process the oil. The Piper Alpha platform is constructed by McDermott Engineering and Union Industrial Enterprise in four modules separated by firewalls. In 1975, the modules are joined together at McDermott's site in Ardesia in Scotland, then floated out to the Piper oil field, which sits in 475 feet of water. Module A is the drilling module. On the opposite side of the platform is module D, the living quarters. The modules are organized so that high risk activities are furthest from the crew facilities like living quarters in the control room. In 1976, oil production starts producing 250,000 barrels of oil per day and increases to 300,000 barrels a day under phase one production, which is limited to oil only. Piper Alpha is the central oil platform. The main oil pipeline runs from Piper Alpha to Flutter. The Claymore platform pumps oil into the main pipeline 20 miles west of Piper Alpha. The Tartan platform pumps oil to the main line via Claymore. This means Piper Alpha pipes its own oil while Tartan joins the pipe at Claymore. Piper Alpha is one of the heaviest oil platforms operating in the North Sea. In 1978, major reconstruction is started in order to comply with UK gas conservation requirements to capture gas, which is usually flared or burned off as a byproduct of oil extraction. By the end of 1980, a gas conservation module has been installed in module B and C between the control room and the drilling well in order to capture gas and transport it to St. Fergus, north of Aberdeen in Scotland. The gas compression and control room are separated by a firewall. Gas and oil are produced in what is termed phase two production. Both Tartan and Claymore pump gas to Piper Alpha, which in turn pumps all the gas to the MCP1 gas compressing platform 30 miles northwest of Piper Alpha and on to St. Fergus on the mainland. Phase two production of oil and gas continues well into the 80s. By the late 80s, major reconstruction and maintenance is planned. In July 1988, six major projects are underway, including replacing the gas conservation module. Opcal initially planned to reroute gas from Tartan and Claymore, then shut Piper Alpha down entirely while the reconstruction was underway. But in order to keep up with production, they found reasonable safety measures. Throughout the refit, they continued to produce 120,000 barrels of oil a day. In order to replace the gas conservation module on Piper Alpha, the platform returns to phase one production where it produces oil and flares gas. The gas conservation module is removed. Gas from the Tartan and Claymore platforms is still routed via Piper Alpha. At 1200 on the 6th of July, 1988, two condensate pumps, A and B, are separating condensate from gas so they can be processed further at different plants. Condensate is a light form of crude oil that separates from gas during the change of pressure and temperature between the well under the sea and the platform. Pump A gets shut down for biannual inspection and service. First, several meters away on the same pipeline, the pressure safety valve will be inspected and serviced. An engineer removes the pressure safety valve. The open condensate pipe is temporarily sealed with a disc cover, which is a flat metal disc. The cover is hand tightened so the safety valve can easily be replaced after its service. At 1755, the inspection and service are not yet complete. At the end of his shift, the engineer fills in a permit which states pump A is not ready and must not be switched on under any circumstances. At 1800, the day shift ends and the night shift starts. 
62 men now run Piper Alpha, while 164 men eat, sleep and try to relax in the living quarters. The shift manager is busy, so the engineer puts the permit in the relevant equipment box and leaves without discussing the loose fitting flange. At 1800, there's also a change of shift for Piper Alpha's divers. The divers enter the water below the labyrinth of pipes. When they start their shift, they go down a steel staircase and kit up on a steel staging area. The staging area is under the oil processing platform module B, which can become slippery. To combat this, the metal staging area has holes punched into it. These holes perform two functions. The raised edges give workers grip when walking around the structure and they allow any oil drips to fall through rather than pull, which would be a hazard. The divers need to remove their work boots and then get into their dry suits. But these punched holes are sharp, which is good for grip but not pleasant to stand on barefoot. So the divers make a reasonable decision to set up a rubber mat. They kit up and enter the water at 1900. Piper Alpha has an automatic fire suppression system. If a fire is detected, the system will automatically start the diesel pumps. These diesel pumps can pull huge amounts of seawater from 120 feet below the waterline. A network of pipes then spray the decks to douse any flames. When divers are in the water, the fire suppression system is put under manual control. If the pumps are turned on automatically and a diver is near the intake at 120 feet, the divers would possibly be sucked against the intake cage and at best pinned until the pumps are turned off or crushed by the water rushing to fill the intake pipe. The procedure at Claymore platform is to keep the automatic system on while divers are in the water unless they're working within 10 to 15 feet of the intake pipe, in which case, like Piper Alpha, they would turn off the automatic system and operate in manual mode in the event of a fire. Health and safety inspectors have recommended Piper Alpha adopt the same procedure, but with all the reconstruction and maintenance going on, the decision is taken to implement that later. On the 6th of July 1988, the divers are not working near any intake pipes. Further up the pipeline, methane ice is causing a blockage which automatically shuts down pump B at 2145 to prevent pressure building up in the pipeline and engineers can't restart it. The engineers speak with the shift manager to find out if they can start pump A. He reads the work permit for pump A and sees that the scheduled inspection and service has not yet started. Pump A is functional and much like moving your car's annual service from one day to the next, it's reasonable to postpone the inspection and start pump A in order to relieve pressure on the pipeline while they clear the blockage. But the permit for servicing the safety valve on the same pipeline is stored in a different equipment box because the pump and safety valve are in different locations and so he doesn't see the instruction not to start pump A under any circumstances. Under pressure to get the pipeline flowing and narrowly focusing on pump A in one location, the shift manager gives the okay to start pump A not knowing that the safety valve plate is only hand tight. In fact, because the safety valve is several meters away and on a different level, the engineers don't see that the safety valve has been removed. At 2152, pump A is started. Condensate flows into the pipe and almost immediately the engineers hear a high-pitched sound as gas leaks through the hand-tight metal disc covering the safety valve position. Localized gas alarms sound out and men on the platform quickly search out the source of the leak. At 2155, the volatile condensate ignites and an explosion blows through the firewall separating the gas conservation module and the control center. The control room is almost destroyed and several key personnel are killed in the explosion. Jeff Bollins, a shift manager, survives the blast and pushes the emergency shutdown button immediately closing the major valves which stop all gas and oil extraction. He then escapes the area with other able-bodied men. Debris from the explosion ruptures a small condensate pipe which ignites in the flame of the explosion. No alarm is activated in module D, the living quarters of the platform, and because the control center has been destroyed, nobody is giving or receiving instructions to evacuate. Operators at Tartan and Claymore can see that something is wrong by the explosions lighting the sky 20 miles away, but they continue to pump oil and gas because they don't have the authority to shut down production, which could take 
days to get back online. At 22.04, radio operator David Kinraid sends out a mayday call. Today, explosion fire on the Piper platform. All personnel abandoned. At 22.05, Aberdeen Coast Guard Station dispatches a Sea King Helicopter Rescue 138 from Lossimuth Search and Rescue Station. The Royal Air Force dispatch a Hawker Sidley Nimrod from their base at Kinloss to act as the on-scene commander Rescue 1. Support vessels in the North Sea hear the mayday and stand by to act as search and rescue vessels or floating hospitals. At 2206 in Module B, a crude oil storage tank ruptures from the heat. The area is quickly flooded by oil which ignites and billows out a black plume of smoke. The burning oil drips down onto the diver's staging platform and starts to pool on the rubber mat they've installed. The pooling fire grows until 2220 when it burns through the tartan pipeline which explosively ruptures fueling the inferno with almost 30 tons of gas per second. Sailors in ships as far as a mile away feel the explosion ripple through the air. At 2230 the Theros support vessel draws alongside Piper Alpha. She operates as a multifunctional ship including accommodation, a hospital, saturation dive team, search and rescue facilities and high pressure water cannon. She uses her water cannon where possible but it's too powerful to spray at full force which could injure or kill anyone hit by the high pressure water. A triage and reception area is set up on the vessel's heli deck staffed by an offshore medic and assisted by diver paramedics from the Theros saturation diving team. The Sandhaven support vessel arrives on scene and deploys a fast search and rescue boat to find survivors in the water. At 2250 the pipeline leading to the MCP-1 gas platform fails and explodes. The expanding gas pours back out of the pipeline and sprays flames over 300 feet into the air. The Sandhaven's fast rescue boat is trapped by debris from the explosion. Piper Alpha's steel structure starts to melt and the Theros is forced to retreat from the heat of the flames. The Claymore platform stops pumping to Piper Alpha but the 20 mile pipeline still holds a backlog of high pressure condensate and gas. Men on Piper Alpha are either jumping from the platform into the freezing waters of the North Sea or they're trapped in the living quarters module D which is filling with black smoke. Mark Reed thinks of his 14 week old baby boy as he jumps 175 feet from the heli deck. At 2318, the Claymore gas line ruptures and explodes. The backlog of pressure in the pipeline now joins gas from the tartan pipeline to fuel the fire for hours to come. At 2335, the Sea King helicopter Rescue 138 from Lossimuth arrives at the scene and the logistics of moving survivors and key personnel between ships and hospital on the mainland gets underway. Non-essential personnel are removed from the scene and replaced with paramedics from other platforms and ships. At 2350, in the space of two hours since the first ignition from pump A safety valve, the structure starts to collapse. The fire fueled by the gas pipes rising out of the sea from under Piper Alpha has been burning at over 1800 degrees Fahrenheit. It's melted the bottom of the structure and now the infrastructure starts to crumble into the ocean. Then module D, the living quarters, slips below the waterline with almost 100 men waiting for the signal to evacuate. The Sandhaven's trapped search and rescue vessel is pulled into the sinking structure. Two of the boat's crew are killed along with six Piper Alpha crew they had already rescued from the water. The skipper is the only man to survive. By 45 minutes past midnight, the drilling module A is all that remains. Over the next hours, search and rescue boats and helicopters locate survivors and bodies. At 7.25, the last survivors are flown to hospital in Aberdeen. 167 men died, 61 survived. 30 bodies were never recovered. It takes a specialist firefighting team three weeks to extinguish the fire. In late 1988, a saturation dive team recovered the living quarters module D from 475 feet of water, along with the bodies of 87 men trapped inside. While it's not reasonable to expect an outcome like this, the decisions made along the way were reasonable decisions. While those decisions remained isolated, Piper Alpha operated in relative safety. But when those decisions lined up, they created a deadly sequence of events.